Hello, welcome to my little trip down road test in memory lane. Um, I'm in the salubrious surroundings of a Seville hotel room. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm in between launches. Um, a couple of days ago, we were at Porto Mayo, riding a new uh, Honda CBR 1000RR Fireblade SP, um, and also the CBR 600RR. And you can read all about those uh, online and also um, the video for the blade is already up by the time you see this video as well so uh, that's worth watching um, and then a couple of days time I'm gonna make my way to Jerez for a Michelin tire launch where we're going to be riding on three new tires um, a track day tire a pure road sports tire and a dual purpose tire so half on the road, half on the track. So that should be pretty good. Um, thanks for sending in all your questions. Thanks everyone for watching the last Q&A video, which um, a lot of people watch, so thank you very much for that. Um, and I've got a bunch of new questions today, so let's uh, let's crack straight on. First one is from uh, Georgian Steroids. Georgian Steroids, three, four, five, two. Thanks very much for your question. Um, and easy, what's your favorite long-term test bike you've ever had? The one that took you out of bed the quickest. Thanks for all the effort and content. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for asking. I've got a list of all the long-termers I've had since I joined MCN in 2002. So I, uh, when I first joined in 02, I um, inherited someone else's long-termer who had left and it was a pan-European which I wasn't that thrilled about, to be honest. I mean, I was 32 years old, just joined this job, thought I was gonna be um, uh, <laughs> um, having hot and cold running um, fire blades and super sport bikes to play on. And um, I got a pan-European, but it was actually, it was actually pretty good. Um, but in 03, I got a CBR 600RR, which is fantastic. 04, the under seat pipe R1, brilliant. Uh, 05, the K5 GSX R1000, which I raced and rode on the road. I used to take it apart every weekend to race and then put it back together as a road bike. I got it down to about two hours each way. Um, and I actually had that for two years, had it in 06 as well. Um, in 07, I had uh, the 16 valve R1, which I also raced, which is fantastic. Uh, 2008, the GSX R750 K8, amazing. Uh, 09, Ducati Street Fighter, um, that was incredible. That was Ducati's first um, Super Naked, brilliant. 2010, Kawasaki Z1000, which I nicknamed the Trifle because it was uh, orange and white. Uh, 2011, the L1 GSX-R 750, amazing. Uh, 2012, uh, Ducati Street Fighter 848, which is brilliant. 2013, Ducati Hyperstrada, kind of a touring supermoto, which is really good. 2014, BMW S1000R, fantastic. 2015, R1, amazing. 2016, ZX10R, I did a lot on that, it's really good, but I hated the brakes and I hated the riding position and it was too tall geared. It never really felt like a thousand unless you were actually revving it like a 600. 2017, GSX-R1000R, really good road bike, a little bit flawed with its brakes and kind of old fashioned dash, but fantastic. 2018 Panigale V4S, I mean, what an absolute beauty. 2019, the latest generation S1000RR uh, with its shift cam, amazing. 2020 Ducati Street Fighter V4S, I mean, you, I could look at that bike all day, just brilliant. 2021 S1000R, again, amazing. 2022, uh, half the year I had a speed triple 1200RR which I went to Spain on, did loads of stuff, but I just found it incredibly uncomfortable and quite slow steering and not great brakes. I was a bit disappointed with that. Then I had a Tiger 1200 for the latter part of the year, which I absolutely loved, great touring bike. Last year, uh, H2SX, which I've actually still got, it's going back very soon, which um, the ride quality on it is amazing. The smoothness of the engine is amazing, but it's a sports tourer that's a little bit kind of um, compromised in each direction. It's not that comfortable for a tourer and it's not that sporty for a sports bike. Um, and then this year is gonna be a KTM 1390 Super Duke Art Evo. In terms of my favorite, I mean, what would you choose out of that list? 
first of all. Um, I mean, that's a fair old, that kind of sums up the kind of bikes I like, doesn't it? Um, and also sums up um, how when I've got older, I had the odd uh, touring bike as well, but I've got another super naked this year, so that's good. Um, I would say the one that always sticks out for me is the 2014 S1000R. It was a red one and it was just, it was just perfect. It was a really lovely, lovely road bike just to zip around on, you know, go to the shops on it, it was really comfortable. Um, had cruise control and heated grips. It was pretty good touring um, Had a little fly screen on it and it was perfectly okay at motorway speeds. You know, and the, the wind buff tin was less than you get on an adventure bike. And then when you decided to take it on a track, it was amazing. It was right in the kind of the heart of the time I was racing an S1000RR. And um, I kind of set it, set it up in a similar way um, because you've got the adjustment in the suspension. It hasn't quite got the power, but you don't need big super bike power in a super naked. You know, when we test M1000Rs and Street Fighters, you can never use all that power. Um, so kind of 160, 170 bhp is kind of the sweet spot when it comes to super nakeds. Um, and it was well finished, it sounded great. I was really sad to see that go. Uh, and the S1000RR I've, I've had more recently, the new generation one, was kind of more of the same. But I think the original S1000R really sticks in my mind just because it was, I suppose it was sort of the best all-rounder I'd ever ridden at that point in, in terms of combining superbike performance and... Um, kind of practicality and everyday use. And I think I wouldn't mind one in my garage now. You know, you can get them for a reasonable price, maybe six, seven, eight grand, something like that. So yeah, I think uh, I think that is a great bike. That is, that is the one I keep thinking about when I think about my best long-termers and the one at the time I just used to love riding. I went to Ibiza on it, did track days on it. Oh, I just went everywhere. I just, I just really, really loved it. So I actually missed that bike. But thanks very much for your question. Uh, the next one is from uh, Brian Rainey, uh, 2739, thanks for your question. I've noticed over the years of following you that you put a lot more emphasis on tyres and pads than others when you do your reviews. I just see tyres and brake pads as disposables, and if you don't like what comes on your bike then you just swap them out. I'm not sure that OEM choices should carry as much weight when reviewing bikes. I could be wrong though. Well, that's a really interesting question. I mean yeah it's a no-brainer isn't it that if you put better tires on a bike and you put better better brake pads and that kind of stuff you're gonna you're gonna improve it immeasurably um but when it comes to testing you've got to really talk about the bike that's there in front of you you know and if it's got rubbish tires then you say it's got rubbish tires and then the the people that buy them are going to be experiencing rubbish tires until the point they change them you know and the same with the brakes and also you can't um, kind of suppose that if you do change those components, it's going to improve the bike because you don't know that for a fact. The only thing you can say for a fact is what you've got there in front of you. Um, and it also highlights how manufacturers kind of want to cut corners when it, when it comes to producing bikes. You know, if they put cheap tires on the bikes, um, you know, and the rest of the bike's going to be set up around those tires as well, you know. Um, you know, and the, the bikes that come with good brake pads and good tyres are more are more impressive. You know, the first impressions of any bike you ride, are, they kind of stay with you and um, they're very, very important. And I think manufacturers shouldn't uh, skimp and scrape on, on things like that. I mean, I get a lot of questions about OEM tyres. You know, why are they so bad? I mean, they're never, they're never dangerously bad, but their performance is, is quite often lacking and it is just down to price, you know. A manufacturer will work alongside a tyre company to help them develop the bike. Um, the manufacturer asks a tyre company to produce a tyre costing a certain amount and the tyre company will come up with that tyre, which is quite often, it might look like a current tyre, but it might not be the same compound. It might be made in a different factory. It might just not be up to spec. So. When you think that you know tires and brakes are such an important part of the riding experience on a bike, um, that when they're not right, it just it changes the whole complexion of the bike. You know, think of an example. One of the ones I mentioned in that long term list, the the brakes on the ZX Ten R or the GSX R Thousand, they really spoil the riding experience. And I'm sure 
because I've ridden race versions, when you change those components, it transforms the bike. But you know, the bike you've got there that you're testing there and there, you can, that's, that's all you can say really. So, you know, I think to stop that problem happening, manufacturers should put better uh, components on their bikes and then uh, we road testers would be happier bunnies. But it's a really interesting point. Um, you know, yeah, you can improve any bike with better tires and brakes, it's, it's a given. But um, you, you've just got to talk about the bike that's there in front of you at the time. But thanks very much for your question. That is a very, very good one. Next is from uh, Phil Heth and an easy cheers for the awesome content. Thank you for watching. Um, I started doing track days last year, had a great time and I'm moving up to Inters this year. I'm confident on the brakes, but I'm a proper fanny getting on the power out of a corner. Uh, for your information, I'm riding a 636. I know exit speed can be addressed by taking a different line and getting the bike stood up sooner, but I still feel like I'm not using much of the available grip and I'm scared to find out where the limit is. Any tips for me? Thanks. Oh yeah, that is a, that is one of the big um, questions people have on track days. You know, you're, you're sat behind a rider in front and they just disappear off down the straights. So, you know, it's never a question of, you know, just being, you know, taking some brave pills and getting on the throttle sooner or anything like that. You know, the, the sequence of going through a corner has to start from, you know, the moment you, you begin to break, really. And everything follows on from there. When um, I was instructing at the Ron Haslam Race School, the last thing you spoke about was what you do on the throttle. You know, we used to talk about um, body position, gear selection, uh, how to brake, when to let go of the brakes, how much corner speed, entry speed to carry. Um, all of these things that you need, you need all of these things in place before you think about getting on the throttle. And all of these things that you do before you get on a throttle, get the bike in the right position on the track. It, it gives the bike the correct speed on the track before you then pick the bike up and, and go. So if you get all of these things right, naturally, without even trying, you'll be, you'll be harder on the throttle and getting more speed coming out um, without even thinking about it because you've made all those kind of um, adjustments on the way in. Um, you know, a, a lot of, um, you can have a lot of benefit by off throttle turning. So one of the things at the Haslam School, again, from road riders who go on the track, they brake at a certain point, come off the brakes and then get straight on the throttle all the way through the corner, even before they've got to the apex. So they're kind of carrying quite high mid corner speed, um, but they're in the corner for a long time and lent over for a long time on the edge of their tire and they can never get the confidence to get more on the throttle. And if you were then to tell them, okay, just get on the throttle, they'd, they'd high side, they'd crash because they're trying to do too much on the edge of the tire um, with kind of the wrong line. Because if you carry big corner speed, quite often you can't get to the apex consistently. Um, you know, it, really it boils down to going fast into a corner, kind of slowing down quite a lot in the middle of the corner and coming out. Um, but it used to be the opposite with a lot of riders at the Hassam School. They would go relatively slow in, fast through the corner and slow out again. So it's not as easy as just um, saying, you know, pick the bike up, get on the throttle soon or anything like that. You've kind of got to work back from, from the time you start braking or even before, you know, getting into your body position before you brake. So when you actually come to hang off in the corner, you're not upsetting the bike. So yeah, you've got to take all these steps backwards. So. If, if you're really having a problem with that, then I think you just sort of need to take your riding apart and, and kind of start again. Go to some training schools. Steve Brogan do good schools. Um, James Whittam does good schools. MSV have, have got great instructors and No Limits great instructors. So, you know, all of these people will help you. You know, watching um, riding tips videos, Simon Crayfile videos. I do track instruction as well. So, um, that would be my suggestion. But whatever you do, don't just try and get on a throttle harder because it doesn't normally work like that. But um, great question. Thanks for sending it in. Next one. Hi, Michael. Love your vids. Uh, this is from Superbike Junkie. Thanks very much for your question. Uh, my question is, how do you get back into riding after a bad crash? I had a crash a few months ago and broke both of my legs. Uh, but I'm on the mend. Good. Just wondering how I'll respond the day I swing a leg over. Any pointers? Thanks, appreciate it. Well, 
I'm sorry you, you crashed. I'm not sure what kind of crash it was. Was it a track crash? crash? Was it a road crash? Either way, it's not nice. I've, uh, I've broken both my legs before in, a, in an accident. So I feel your pain and broken a lot of bones since. The, the best thing you can do, the best advice is just, well, A, I suppose you need to get to the bottom of why you had this accident in the first place. You know, if it was a road crash involving another vehicle or something like that, you need to take steps to make sure that doesn't happen again. Easier said than done, obviously. But if you watch some of the MCN Secrets of a Road Tester videos, which we've done, um, you know, when you when you talk about state of mind, not trusting anybody on the road, you know, assuming everyone's out to get you, you know, you can normally stay out of trouble. So there's those kind of things. If it was a, a track crash and you know why it happens, you know, you just don't do that again. <laughs> Um, but in terms of the physicality of getting on a motorbike, um, you know, you need to be fit, you know, a little bit of, of, of some kind of uh, physio or training or something like that before you get on a bike would help, you know, getting on push bikes as well, just to get in the feel for being on two wheels and, and pedaling and sort of being out and about helps as well. And then in terms of getting on a motorbike, you know, whether it's the track or the road is just to build up really, really slowly. Um, you know, don't rush. That's the same with with any any type of riding. You've just got to you've just got to build up. Um, you know, whether you're trying to set lap records or whether you're trying to get over an injury, it's just a question of taking it easy. Um, and you might find that you know your legs might not be as flexible as they were before. I'm not sure what what kind of bike you've got, but you know, if you've got like a really cramped sports bike and you can't bend your legs properly, you know, maybe think about getting something different. Uh, like a more upright naked or a tall rounder or an adventure bike or something like that but um yeah i think knowing why you crashed and you know hoping that or or, or taking steps into making sure that doesn't happen again take away some of the fear um, and then the physicality of it just getting on the bike and, and just take it easy just be really really careful ride on your own don't ride with other people you know because you always feel you can feel pressured by them, you know, to, to go a certain pace or you might feel like you're holding them up or whatever. You just just get out and about on your own and, and just take it one step at a time. Hopefully you can take some steps as well. So, um, but no, but good luck with it. Let me know how you get on. So thanks for the question. Next one is from Metal Petrol. Hi Neasy, followed you in MCN since 16 year old me, dreamt of getting a big bike back in 2008. Love the videos. Wow, thanks very much. Um, I'm thinking about a second bike, but want something very different to my track biased VFR 750 Resto mod. That I don't just jump on the modern bike every time I want to ride. Well, that sounds like a nice bike. I've been considering a few bikes that look cool um, and fine with a wife on. I've narrowed them down to a Ducati Scrambler 800 Classic trim level, uh, a KTM 890 Duke, and the XSR 900 to know your thoughts cheers hmm. are those bikes okay so the ducati the cat is a lovely thing isn't it it's a, a nice little retro i would say that if you just want to kind of plod around the countryside taking the scenery i think it's a nice choice it isn't the biggest bike in the world for two up you might not have a lot of space for you and your wife together. It depends how, uh, what size you are. Um, but that's the bike for kind of taking it easy. It's quite a mellow bike, the, the Scrambler. You know, it's, it, it feels relatively heavy. The engine's quite uh, the, the, the linear. I won't call it flat, but it's linear. Um, but yeah, it's just a, like a Sunday morning cafe bike, really. KTM 890 Duke <laughs> is the complete opposite. That is just like a, a bike that wants to be a supermoto. So, you know, if you want to go around with your, your hair on fire, then that's the bike to get. It might be a little bit uh, OTT for two up riding. You know, that bike's always straining at the leash. Um, but if that's what you want, that might be right up your street. Or the XSR 900, I would say that's the one I would go for. You know, that sits nicely in the middle of those two bikes that nt09 engine that it's got is absolutely superb loads of grunt loads of character just as nice to ride slowly as it is flat out really great engine 
Uh, I'm not sure what model it is, but you know, the early ones, the chassis geometry wasn't great. I used to understeer quite a lot because the front of the bike's quite high and hard and the back's soft, um, which is a consideration. If you're gonna go two up, you need to wind the shock up or maybe even get a, a stiffer shock or aftermarket shock with a stiffer spring. Um, but that bike's physically roomier as well. So I think it'd be better for two up. So I think, you know, for two up, the engine and the character of the bike would sort of suit more steady riding. And then when you're on your own, then you can then you can have a bit of fun on it. So yeah, I'd go for the Yamaha of those three bikes. But let me know what you, what you get on with. And finally, um, we've got one from Rod. I should read these first, shouldn't I? Uh, Rod in Toulouse. Rodan Toulouse, 3054. Thanks very much for your question. Uh, hi, Michael. Thank you for all your fantastic content. Does your girlfriend ride or do you always travel two up? I'm trying to get my wife to get her own license so we can travel longer in more comfort. Cheers. Um, good question. Uh, my girlfriend is learning to ride. So we've never, well, actually, we have been out together when um, she's learning. But most of the um, touring we do is two up. Um, there's pros and cons to it. The it depends what kind of bike. I mean, the two two up riding that we've been doing on a H two SX and a Tiger twelve hundred has been really nice and comfortable. So it's not really a problem being two up, um, and it's more convenient. You know, when you're when you're riding a bike on your own, you can whiz through traffic. You can park where you want. You're not having to 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 wait for the other rider. Um, and the bikes have always been powerful enough where you don't really notice a pillion on the back anyway. Um, but then there's a lot to be said if you ride together. You know, it, it is, you know, you're in control of your own destiny when you're riding on your own. It'd probably be a lot more enjoyable for your wife as well. Um, but the only thing I would say is that um, if your wife is going to get her license, you know, she's going to go through the same period of, of learning to ride and getting comfortable with bikes that we've all gone through. Um, and you can't run before you can walk, like we said in one of the other questions about, you know, learning to ride again after an accident. So to begin with, you know, your, your two, up, two up touring, you're going to have to kind of, you know, throttle back on the distances you want to travel each day, you know, maybe how far or how long you go as well, because for a newer rider, a newer rider has to concentrate a lot more, you know, a newer rider is going to be a lot more nervous than someone who's more experienced. So it's going to be more difficult for them. So, you know, as long as you kind of cut the cloth to suit and, and change your kind of touring itinerary, so you're not doing so many miles, um, so your wife feels more comfortable, then, then yes, it's a fantastic idea. I know that, you know, you're always going to be worried about your partner if they're following on a on another bike like you know you're worried about your friends or family who ride with you as well so that's another concern um but equally you worry when you take someone to up because you're responsible for them and there's nothing they can do about any event that happens their, their life is completely in your hands so you know that's another consideration but yeah i'd say it'd be a great thing to have your wife um travel with you on your your touring holidays and she can get to enjoy the bike and see what we why we're all so passionate about riding bikes I think she'll have a great time um, and I hope that happens for you and you'll have to let me know if that if that works out um, but that's it for today's Q&A and um, I will be back very very soon with uh, a similar video and if you liked this video please like and subscribe and uh, I'll see you again soon